my name is Tim Strack with LogPoint, and I'm going to give you a demo today of our LogPoint technology. I'm going to show you both the UEBA and the SIM aspects of, uh, of LogPoint. I'm going to do the uh, first one slide for you. I'm going to cover one slide just to give you a little bit of background what we're doing behind the scenes, and then I'm going to jump into the web interface. So LogPoint can collect logs from any type of device that you have out there, databases, endpoints, applications, printers, IoT things, firewalls. Basically, if it generates a log, we can collect it. Once we collect that log, we're going to do a uh, number of things with it. The first thing we're going to do is normalize that log data, making it so that you don't have to be a subject matter expert in log data to use LogPoint. We're going to uh, uh, parse that log out into all sorts of various normalized fields, like source address, destination address, source port, destination port, a user, just an application, a wide variety of fields there. But we're also going to identify with a label the type of log that it is. So a label might be that it's a network traffic message uh, so that you can very, uh, very easily identify those. On the enrichment source, we're going to integrate with other things. One uh, prime example of a data enrichment would be threat intelligence feeds. We can pull in threat intelligence feeds data and we can use that uh, to tell you if if that uh, the threat feed has been found against that source address or that destination address, just as one uh, simple example of enrichment. And then we also have routing uh, policies that we can have, and that kind of takes us into our next section on storage. With routing policies, we can take data and put it into different storage repositories, and you can, you can be very customizable with that. So an example, you can take uh, you know, all firewall data and put it in one repository where because that's very noisy, you store that for 30 days or maybe you store it for 90 days on, you know, different tier disks, things like that. And then you can do other things like, uh, you know, Windows server data. I want to store that for, you know, 30 days on SSDs and then 90 days out on some, uh, you know, uh, other uh, less expensive disks beyond that and then a whole year on even cheaper disks beyond that. So you have a very uh, good level of flexibility there. Another thing you can do with routing policies is you can map key value pairs to things. So let's say you want to you want to look for a certain list of sensitive users. You can say if the user equals this sensitive person, we're going to ch change where we store their data to another repository. So maybe your policy is to store 90 days overall for logs, but if they're part of a sensitive user group, now we want to store those logs for 365 days. So that's just an example of what we could do uh, with routing and storage repositories. Over on the analytics side, of course, we have searching built in. I'll show you that inside the web interface uh, and correlation rules as well. We have a UEBA engine that's doing machine learning for you. So I will be, I'll be sure to, to talk about and show you that as well. But the really beautiful thing about UEBA is that it is a rule-less approach where you don't have to go in and tweak things manually yourself. The system just sort of uh, baseline what's normal and gives you alerts to anything that deviates from that normal activity. And then the final thing we have is automated response. So we have the ability to take uh, corrective action uh, by executing any SSH command uh, when an alert triggers. So that's a pretty powerful tool. So with that slide uh, done and over with, I'll go ahead and jump in and show you the web interface there. The first thing I'm going to talk about with you today is the UEBA portion of our web interface. Then I'll jump into the uh, other SIM dashboards that are built in. I'll go over uh, to searches, talk about searching, then paper-based reporting, and then I'll wrap up with alerts and incident management. So on the UEBA page, uh, again, this is a, uh, a completely machine learning tool. There's nothing for you to have to build or tweak with rules or anything like that. The system's going to baseline and to try to detect anomalies on its own, things that we found. The overall uh, risk page just shows us a very high level of our environment, the different types of activities that were found in our environment over various points of time. And we can see that we've had 114 million events analyzed, uh, but only 2,500, almost 2,600 of them were anomalies, and only 22 were from active uh, risky entities there. I'm going to go ahead over to the Explore uh, tab, which is going to give me just a little bit more information on that. On this Explore tab, I can tell very quickly that I have, out of uh, the different risk ratings we assign, we have six extremely risky items, four high-risk items, 
zero medium risk and two low risk. Just below that, I've got a time frame showing me uh, all of the different activity across the environment. And then over to the left, I've got my top risk users. Uh, this is the chart I really uh, like to talk about because this is a color-coded numeric value between one and 100 to tell me how threatening each of those users are. So I can see Joshua here has that 98 risk score associated with him. Any of these uh, fields I can click on to drill into that data. So if I click on Joshua, it's very interactive. The rest of the fields will switch to that. Joshua by himself has uh, six extremely risky events. If I go over here to the right, I can see those uh, color-coded events here as far as what's risky and what's not. When I look at some of the things in red, I can see that Joshua sent 1.31 gigabytes in an hour using the post command, whereas Joshua typically only sends 821 kilobytes in an hour. So that is pretty suspicious behavior if you ask me. We can see that the system has, the UEB agent has flagged this as a potential data theft. And we can see just before that, what really makes this suspicious to me is that we have potential data staging uh, just before that. So again, it's a, it's a nice engine to pick up on those needles in a haystack that you'd never otherwise uh, normally look for. So moving on from that, I'm gonna jump into the SIM uh, dashboards. You can hit the plus button and create your own dashboard from scratch just by giving it a name but we also have a vendor dashboard section. In the vendor dashboard section, we take the whole build a SIM approach out of everything. So we go, we go and take all of the time necessary to build uh, dashboards based off of particular products. We do it out of our way to build dashboards based around compliance objectives around particular use cases. As you can see here, some PCI dashboards uh, that are available to check and use as needed. So we really take that effort out of having to build a lot of the content yourself and then give you, um, you know, give you all that stuff. That stuff is all included in the licensing model. There is no additional cost for compliance based for uh, dashboards or reporting or alerts or anything like that. I'm going to go over and show you just a couple of these out of the box ones that I've already got uh, imported here. One is around threat intelligence. We do integrate with any kind of threat intelligence uh, third party feed. Uh, just as a simple example, I have proof points in here as uh, already. And when I the, uh, when I go through this data, I can see all all sorts of data around that uh, that, that uh, threat intelligence feed itself. When I look down here at the very bottom, I can see uh, threat maps around that information as well. Top ten outbound attacks by country. Top ten inbound attacks by country. Uh, we are doing GYP lookup on any public facing IP address that you have. So uh, we can we can do that as part of our part of our search capability and populate these charts with you know where in the world is this data coming from and going to. You will notice that these dashboards do update. They are uh, working off of live data, so they are continuously updating on their own. No refresh button required for that. Another one I always like to show is the Active Directory tab. The Active Directory tab I enjoy showing because. It gives you uh, a lot of stuff that is just a generally good security practice to follow, but it's also used in almost every think of. So we have things like accounts being created and deleted and lockouts and password resets and uh, all sorts of other activity like that. These charts are highly customizable. Uh, as you can see here, I've got a couple of donut charts, a column chart, a radar chart. If I want to adjust those or change those charts, I can just hit this drop down arrow and select the other type of chart that I want. So I can turn that one into a donut chart if I want to, and this one into one of those radar charts if I like that. So very uh, simple to click on and use. Lastly, I want to talk about uh, file access, and it's more about a discussion of a feature that we have. But one of the features that LogPoint has is file integrity monitoring. File integrity monitoring and registry integrity monitoring are built into the log point agent. Unlike some of our competitors, you do not have to pay extra for that agent uh, license that is just, again, included in the uh, base cost. So now that I've done that, I'm going to go over the uh, to the searching side, cover a little bit about our search query for you. Our, the same query language that we use for searching is the same query language used to build dashboard widgets to create your own custom reports, to create alerts that you want to do. All of this works off of the uh, same query language that we use for searching. So it really does help uh, simplify that whole process. What I'm gonna do here 
is I'm going to uh, talk about the two different types of search methods that we have. We have a structured search method and an unstructured search method. The structured search method would be things like the source address equals this, the user equals this, the port equals that, uh, that kind of um, thing. So it's very uh, key value pair base. The other type of uh, search method we have is an unstructured search. The unstructured search is a Google-like search against the raw log data. So I'm going to start with that unstructured search. I'm going to type the word Dropbox in here, which is just going to search for anywhere that key phrase is found. And then over here on the right, I'm going to pick my time frame. So I've got anywhere from minutes, uh, hours, days. I've got last uh, custom picker here. I can even choose years worth of time. And then I've got a custom from to date and time picker where I can get very granular with the hour and the minute of the day. I'm going to go ahead and pick 24 hours for this search here. This will go back, find any logs where that phrase Dropbox is found. When I look at these log messages, I've really got three sections here. This is the, when I was talking in the PowerPoint slide about the labels, this is an example of label where we have a connection traffic message uh, coming out. This comes off of a networking device, whereas down here we have an uh, object access attempt where you've got people accessing files or, or folders that have Dropbox in the names, and potentially the Dropbox client could be installed on that host. Just below that, though, each of those uh, labels, we have the, uh, the key value pairs that are pulled out of that log message. Just below that, one step further, we have the raw log data there as well. So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm going to uh, go in uh, and show you more of a structured search. I'm gonna start by changing this uh, just keyword search there from Dropbox to application equals Dropbox to use one of my normalized fields. And then with the structure searching, I have the ability to manipulate that data and present it the way I want, rather than seeing just a whole bunch of logs. So the first thing I'm gonna do is hit the pipe symbol, and that's gonna present me with a list of choices of what to, choose, what to do to manipulate that. In this case, I'm gonna create a chart off of it to show you today. So I'll select chart from that list. As you can see, when I hit space again, I then get a list of suggestions, average, count, minimum, maximum, sum, of what I wanna make that chart on. This makes it very easy uh, to learn this query language because everything uh, makes suggestions and comes up for you with that. I'm gonna go ahead and do this on the sum of the data size field. That is one of the fields that's in uh, some of those network log messages of how much data is being sent out uh, to that Dropbox. So inside of those parentheses, I'm gonna put that field name, data size, and then I'm just going to sort that by user. Again, as I type, things are being populated. I'm going to go ahead and hit that search button there. And now I've got a chart with all of my users and how much data they're sending out the Dropbox. I can then interact with this chart. So if I want to sort that by the data size now, I can click on that. I can see that Zena is my largest user sending data out uh, to Dropbox very easily looking at this table. I've got a column chart just above that. If I want to change that column chart to a different chart type, just like I showed you in the dashboard before, I can do that here. I can make it a donut chart. I can make it a radar chart or a heat map chart. Uh, whatever works uh, for me there, I can pick that. And then I can take that chart and I can add that over to the dashboard as a widget. So I can click add search to dashboard and it will add that over there. I also have the capability to add that search to an alert rule. So if I want an alert anytime someone goes to Dropbox and tells me how much data they're sending, I can easily create an alert rule off of that. And I've got a few other uh, options there as well. Under the more section here, I've got the ability to export that out as a uh, report. So I can run that as a paper-based report if I want to. And that, uh, which leads us over to our next topic, which is paper-based reporting. So for reporting, we have, uh, of course, just a lot of same, same thing as uh, dashboards, a lot of out-of-the-box reports. You don't have to build them. They are built around particular device types. They are built around uh, compliance objectives that you may have, use cases, things like that. The one I'm going to show you here is the PCI compliance report. I'm just going to use this PDF. Uh, the logos and everything here is completely customizable, so you can set them to whatever you'd like. And then when we go through any compliance-based report, there's typically uh, a section that tells you what this, what this part of the report is mapping to. So this one's looking for failed logins, gives you a brief paragraph to describe that. Just below that, we've got tables worth of data. And then we've got, uh, of course, uh, a few charts worth of uh, data as well, representing this, uh, this information for this particular PCI report. 
I'm going to go back over here uh, to my settings on those reports. And I'm going to configure, let's say, this ISO user account management report. When I go into the configuration side of this, you'll notice that these search strings that we have here are the same search language that we use under searches. So it's very easy to uh, run those searches. You can see the different type of charts that I have configured. I have some bar charts, some pie charts, things like that. Over here on the right, we've got scheduling of information. So under scheduling, we can schedule those to run hourly, daily, weekly, or monthly. We can have them run uh, you know, on uh, any schedule that you want with that. And then we can have them export in PDF, HTML, Excel, Word document, or CSV file. They will automatically show up under the generated reports under this inbox section in the web UI, but you can also have them email those reports out to people directly if you want to. So it's just a little bit about reporting. The last section here I'm going to show you today is our alerts. And I'm going to go ahead into our alert roles. Again, we have vendor ones, which are pre-built out of the box, ready to go. Uh, same concept as before with reports and dashboards. But I'm going to go over here and look for a brute force attack one where it's been successful. This is looking for five failed logins, followed by a successful login for the same user within a five-minute period. When I open that up, I've got, again, the same query language here. This is an example of a correlation rule where we're looking for two different searches to happen, and then we're going to tie those together by the username. So uh, we do have correlation capability built in that query language uh, so that we can pull that up. You can then assign risk ratings uh, to those alerts. And so we have a risk set, this, uh, this one in particular, set to high. That'll come into our incidents tab that I'm going to show you shortly after I'm covered alerts with you. And then you can set up notifications for those alerts. So you just hit this bell icon to set up the notifications. And the most common form of notification is email notification. So we can send a custom email off to people. You can customize the subject and the body of those emails. You can use these variables. In this case, we're printing the user for each one for this particular alert. But you can uh, customize the users that you want to include there. We have SSH notifications, so this is our ability to execute, as I mentioned earlier in the PowerPoint slide, execute an SSH command whenever an alert triggers. This opens up an unlimited possibility of doors for you as far as executing scripts out, uh, scripts out there just to um, take action whenever your alerts trigger. Some examples of things you could do would be killing a process, starting or stopping a service. Uh, you could watch. Um, for backup jobs to fail and start them. You can see like a painful service dies on you every so often without a real rhyme or reason. You can have LogCoin monitor for that service to stop and automatically start it back up. Blocking uh, IP addresses on firewalls, more from the security side. So you've got a lot of capability that this unlocks uh, just by being able to execute any script that you, you write, uh, we can run via an SSH command. We have HTTP notifications. That's so great for integration with other applications. Syslog notification, also integration with other applications, but this also allows us to create a feedback loop into LogPoint. So what we can say is, okay, I see that this uh, alert triggered, now I wanna send a message back into LogPoint so that I can look for you know, five alarms triggering within a short time period for the same user, for the same host, or what have you. SNMP notification, again, we can send an SNMP out that's great for integration with other applications. Once those alerts trigger, they will cause an incident to occur. Incidents are color-coded and are risk-based. Uh, risk the risk ratings are critical, high, medium, and low for these. I can see that I don't have any red ones, so I don't have any critical ones showing there on the screen, so I'm going to put a filter in place for that. So let's take a look at the critical ones. You can put a filter in place along a lot of different uh, uh, lines here. Like I mentioned earlier, these alerts will trigger incidents, but uh, anything you find in searching, you can add those uh, logs that you found to an incident, and then that would just be the search type here. Uh, right there, if I look at some of these critical ones, I can choose to add comments to this. I can view the log data behind it. If I do add a comment, it will add the user who added that comment, the comment that they made, and the date and timestamp. I can choose to resolve it. All of those kind of uh, status things will be included in that same trail. So it's just a great way to review your data. Anyway, that was a very high level overview of the LogPoint SIM. I hope you found that really useful.
and uh, we will uh, go ahead and open the floor to any questions.